So where do biophotons fit into my theory? Biophotons are simply light that's emitted from biological material such as the human body. In 1970, Fritz Albert Popp was a theoretical biophysicist teaching radiology at the University of Marburg in Germany. Radiology involves the interaction of electromagnetic radiation on biological systems. At that time he was working on two almost identical molecules, benzo-apyrene and benzo-epyrene. This is organic matter and the former is a lethal carcinogen and the latter is not. There is only a very small difference in their molecular makeup and yet the difference in their toxic toxicity is profound. Pop was observing the different effects of UV light on these molecules. Ultraviolet light has a wavelength of about 380 nanometers and a frequency of 10 to the power of 15 hertz which is just outside the range of visible light. Its wavelength is shorter than visible light and its frequency is faster. Ultraviolet and visible light are electromagnetic waves, the same as all the other waves in the electromagnetic spectrum, which ranges from radio waves at one end that have a very long wavelength and a comparatively slow frequency through to gamma rays with a very short wavelength and a very fast frequency of 10 to the power of 20 hertz. The ultraviolet light that POP was using is towards the middle of the electromagnetic spectrum as is visible light. So when Pop was using UV light on these benzopyrenes, he found that the toxic version, which is found in coal tar and cigarette smoke amongst other things, absorbed the light and then re-emitted it at a completely different frequency. The other molecule, which is harmless to humans, benzoepyrene, allowed the light to pass through unaltered. The carcinogenic molecule appeared to Pop to be a light scrambler. So Pop proceeded to perform the same experiment on other compounds, 37 in total, and he got precisely the same result. He found that he was able to predict which substances were carcinogenic from this scrambling effect they had on UV light. In every case, they re-emitted re the light at a different frequency. Also, the carcinogenic substances absorbed the light at a specific frequency, 380 nanometers in the ultraviolet range. Pop went in search of an explanation for this and came across the phenomenon called photorepair. You can blast a cell with ultraviolet light to the point that it is almost completely destroyed, including the DNA in its nucleus, and then by simply using light of the same frequency but of much weaker intensity, the cell can be restored as good as new. In addition to which, Pop knew that this photo repair process is defective in patients with xeroderma pigmentosum. These patients actually die of skin cancer as a result of solar damage because their skin has no ability to repair itself. It was even known that photo repair works most efficiently at a wavelength of 380 nanometers, the same frequency that these carcinogens were absorbing light and then scrambling it. Obviously, there had to be some connection, or at least it appeared so to Pop, who proceeded to write a groundbreaking paper that was published in a prestigious medical journal, where he argued that there must be some kind of light naturally produced by the body that is responsible for photo repair. Furthermore, external substances, substances must cause cancer by absorbing this natural light and scrambling the frequency so it loses its repair capabilities. After this initial discovery, Pop and his PhD student Bernard Ruth set about to prove that light was emanating from the human body. His student was a gifted experimental physicist and he constructed a machine along the lines of an X-ray detector that could count photons one at a time. This machine had to be extremely sensitive in order to accurately capture the extremely weak emissions 
that they assumed would be emanating from the human body, Popp came to the conclusion that photons, that is light, controls everything in the cell. He found that all the molecules that make up the cell responded to individual frequencies and that these molecules in turn modulated the frequencies of other processes further down the line. The photons have been likened to the conductor of an orchestra directing all the individual instruments, the, in this case the components in the cell, with his baton. Different frequencies signal all the myriad processes and functions that's going on in the cell. There's so much of conventional genetics and biology that remains unexplained. For instance, how enzymes can recognize their substrates, how antibodies in the immune system can grab onto specific foreign invaders and disarm them, how protons can dock with different partner proteins, or latch onto specific nucleic acids to control gene expression. That's just a few. The best explanation offered by biologists and geneticists are variations on the so-called lock and key model, where molecules randomly bump into each other, and in so doing they find other molecules with complementary shapes that they can lock into, and thus allow biochemical reactions to take place. The process has been likened generally to finding a friend in a very big crowded ballroom in the dark. In every cell there can be hundreds of thousands of molecular pairwise interactions every second. So the conventional explanation of finding the best fit through random collisions is actually no explanation at all. Likewise. The explanations of geneticists that segments of DNA are translated and transcribed into proteins is devoid of any spe specific explanation as to how the genetic information actually translates into biological function. The one DNA sequence can encode for several different proteins through multiple splice sites or whatever. Genes can and proteins with similar sequences can have totally different functions. Although it is widely accepted that the secondary and tertiary structure of proteins are crucial for their functioning, the basis sequences of amino acids that make up the protein are completely silent as to how and why these protein structures can form. All this information and much more besides must come from some source other than the linear sequence of bases of the DNA molecule. It is obvious that a mechanical explanation for the molecular interactions in cells is inadequate, and there is an ever-growing body of research known as biophotonics or bioinformatics that shows that the interactions are actually electromagnetic in nature. Each molecule can send out a unique electromagnetic field that can sense the field of a complementary molecule. They envisage the cellular milieu as a kind of ballroom with all the molecules dancing to the rhythm of these biophotons. The molecules send out specific frequencies of electromagnetic waves which enable them to see and to hear each other at a distance. They see each other with optical waves, photons, and they hear each other with acoustic waves, phonons. This enables them to interact at a distance and the dance begins. The photons and phonons are capable of exciting the molecules at the atomic level and this is what is necessary for a chemical reaction to take place.